Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our program with our guest uh, speaker, Professor Jane uh, Leiters from uh, the University of Denver. Um, um, it, it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome you all this morning. And I'm Oben Zawu, and I'm going to say a few words about the program. Uh, um, about our program, which is funded by the European uh, Commission through the H 2020 and Mercury uh, actions. So um, every month we, um, uh, we, we convene guest speakers to address uh, different challenging issues uh, in energy, uh, environment, and natural resources. So our series, uh, our series will, um, will feature on November 22nd, Professor Lisa Sachs from uh, Columbia University on the role and implications of uh, international investment law uh, for energy, natural resources, and climate. Feel free to visit uh, our website, www.law.uh.edu slash in our center. Now I'll turn it over to Professor Tracy Hester, co-director co of uh, uh, the, the INR Center and our chair this morning. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see all of you, uh, electronically at least. Uh, as Alban has mentioned, I'm Tracy Hester. I'm a professor at the University of Houston Law Center. And I'm currently at this point, one of the co-directors for our Environment, Energy, Natural Resource Center, as well as a separate center for carbon management and energy and working towards a carbon pivot. Uh, in that regard, I wanted to fulfill my duties today, which is to welcome all of you and also to emphasize Alban's invitation to join our future lectures and to introduce our speaker this morning, who it's a great treat to have. Uh, Jan Latos is going to be speaking to us today about his book on how to rethink environmental law, uh, which is a topic of great interest to me, uh, in particular since uh, we've been skirmishing over this and trying to think of whether there's a restatement of environmental law that might be somewhere in the future. Uh, Jan it brings a long and distinguished history and background. Uh, he is the Joe Juhan, Endowed Professor of Property Rights and Policy at Sturm College of Law at the University of Denver. He also was the director of their Environmental and Natural Resources Law Program, which as we all know is uh, one of the most highly ranked and nationally prominent programs in the country. And uh, also previously had been a law clerk at the, uh, sorry, at the Colorado Supreme Court for the Chief Justice there. As someone is teaching water law, I can tell you that the Colorado Supreme Court is a very interesting institution and is doing some very uh, creative stuff. And we also worked in the Office of Legal Counsel within DOJ, which is, we all know, is part of the, the brain trust for that entity. Uh, so with that, we will be taking questions, uh, preferably by chat while Jen is speaking, and we'll try and curate those. We'll also have a live Q&A session once he's done. And uh, our goal is to be done by one hour, which would be 10 o'clock central time. So with that, John, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for the, uh, the invitation. Um, and uh, I, I do have to do a quick full disclosure uh, to you all about my connection uh, to your center uh, there. Uh, many years ago, uh, one of your uh, esteemed professors, who I believe is on uh, senior status, emeritus status now, uh, Jacqueline Weaver, uh, she and I were trustees at the uh, Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation for years and years. And uh, she and I conspired uh, at one point to see if maybe I could lateral uh, to the University of Houston Law School and actually assume, I think, maybe the position you're in right now, uh, Tracy, because that was uh, open uh, and, uh, and she thought I would be a good fit. And I uh, did, uh, did some investigation myself uh, about the, uh, the center and uh, we proceeded fairly far along. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, I was so impressed with what uh, the, the Houston Law School and the center uh, were interested in, in doing and uh, where they were exploring to, to go into the future. Uh, and the only reason why I didn't transfer was because I had um, a dean who refused to let me go, basically, who uh, mm -hmm. essentially, um, what would be the word, made me an offer I could not refuse. And so I was, I was stuck at the University of Denver uh, for the rest of my natural life. Uh, but I have always wondered 
uh, if that would, was an opportunity that would have been uh, an interesting experience for me. And here I am many years later speaking to you. So anyway, I have a, a, a long history with you folks uh, vicariously and, uh, and it's nothing but being impressed uh, with uh, what you have accomplished and the reputation that your center has uh, around the United States as well too. In many ways, our program here at Denver is trying to emulate what you folks have done uh, at Houston. So I'm honored uh, in many ways to be invited to, uh, to speak uh, with you today. Uh, so my, my uh, I guess, presentation today uh, involves a question that I had uh, that I think in some ways is, is a question that your center and individuals where you are probably having as well too. And it's, a, it's almost a conundrum or almost a paradox that has arisen in this country, which um, you're all familiar with. And let me just lay it out for you. And the question really involves the, the history of environmental law. Uh, as, as, as I remember very well, and is, is true as a matter of historic fact, uh, there was no environmental law until the 1960s, until the very end of the 1960s. Uh, it was not taught in law schools. There were no case books. It was not a separate discipline. Uh, it was basically a field that was invented. It was invented by law professors and policymakers uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. And it was invented because we, uh, as a country, realized that there was a real issue we had in this uh, country, uh, and it was an issue called pollution. Uh, and the, the, the pollution that was happening with respect to the air and the waters uh, really got our attention. It took us you know, centuries to figure it out, uh, but until the 1960s, we, we didn't do much about it. But in the 1960s, as, as we all know, is when the federal government and many state governments be, became involved with addressing this problem of pollution. So we had this, uh, this, this, this history of essentially realizing there was an environmental problem. In this case, the environmental problem was pollution. And then collectively as a state and as a nation, we enacted laws to try to address the problem. And a series of statutes uh, were enacted and, it, and agencies were created uh, like the Environmental Protection Agency. They were, their sole purpose was to basically, let's fix this problem of pollution. Uh, air and water pollution. Uh, and, uh, and that was uh, the state of affairs for you know, maybe 10 years or so when we realized there was another environmental problem. And that environmental problem involved toxic and hazardous waste. And that involved land pollution and underground pollution as well. And what do we do about that problem? Uh, that's the Love Canal uh, problems and all that. Well, the answer, of course, when you have a problem like that is, well, let's turn to the law again and let's come up with more laws. And so there's a whole history of, of federal laws and state laws uh, being enacted. Uh, and they have names like CERCLA, RICRA, TOSCA, FIFRA, all these federal statutes addressing another environmental problem. And that was in place. These were all uh, risk assessment and risk-based laws that were enacted back in, back in the day. And, uh, and that took place over the 1980s into the 19, uh, 1990s. And then as we moved towards uh, the end of the, the century, and as we moved into the 21st century, we began to realize, well, there's yet another problem uh, that is out there uh, that we haven't seemed to address. And that is, it seems like we are uh, in some ways altering uh, the uh, climate. Uh, we're altering uh, the, uh, the temperature of the planet. And what are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna handle that? That was like something that was slowly percolating through the, uh, the academic world and through the, uh, the policy world. And, uh, and, and when we get, began to realize it was a earth-based problem, not just a localized pollution problem, uh, there was again, uh, this, this magical, well, let's get some good laws out there to try to address this problem of carbon-based, uh, carbon-caused 
uh, issues of climate change, uh, global more warming, what have you. And, uh, and a series of laws and more, more likely proposals to, to have laws uh, were, were, were suddenly rising to the, to the forefront of academics and, and policy making. And we had uh, inventions like, well, why don't we create a, um, a cap and trade system where we uh, put a cap on the amount of carbon in the uh, in the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and try to you know ratchet it down by having individuals uh, uh, have the ability within a cap uh, to to lower the amount of carbon. We even had a, a bill enacted by. Uh, the United States uh, House of Representatives in 2009, uh, when President Obama was elected, that actually did that. Uh, and many countries have tried to do the same thing. Uh, and then we got even more sophisticated. We came up with uh, full disclosure laws. Let's disclose uh, what uh, we are doing and, and how our activities are affecting uh, the, the amount of carbon and, and what's, what's going on with climate change. Let's impose those on us as well, too. And, uh, and then we proposed laws that had to do even more uh, exciting laws, or at least proposals. Many of these were never enacted, uh, such as uh, why don't we put a carbon tax uh, uh, out there so that that will tell us exactly what the cost is of using carbon. And then even more creative laws were, were thought of, and this is in the 21st century, uh, laws like um, the, uh, the Cass Sunstein, uh, Richard Thaler uh, a nudge, idea. Now let's come up with um, uh, opt-in and opt-out uh, possibilities as well. And uh, exciting, creative ideas to try to address this problem of, of climate change. And that was, you know, hot stuff, uh, 2010, uh, 2015. And then we, we, we arrive at today, uh, 2021. And what's the status of our environment in the year 2021. Uh, and, uh, and I don't have to tell you what the status is. Uh, we are all going to hell in a handbasket right now. Uh, it's turned out that we are now in a position where for the first time uh, since Homo sapiens walked upon the earth, uh, we are engaged in activities which uh, if continued, uh, appears to basically be a, a, a very fast track to the end of our species, uh, that we may in fact uh, be over as a species on this planet within a hundred years if we don't do anything to stop our, uh, our desire, our, our, our fierce you know, race to destroy ourselves. Uh, because we are not in the year 2021 just causing pollution. Uh, what we are doing now is literally changing the life systems that uh, have allowed uh, life to exist and Homo sapiens to, to evolve. And we did it to ourselves. That's why we're now in the, not the Holocene, but the Anthropocene uh, era. And if that's the case, and we did it to ourselves, and, and, and it's not getting any better. In fact, all readings are, it's getting worse. Well, then the question is, is this, is this finally a problem that we can't solve? We, we have finally arrived at a problem that is uh, unsolvable. Uh, there's nothing we can do to fix it. It is absolutely uh, an intractable, uh, un unassailable, cannot ever uh, address this problem successfully. Is that what's going on? Uh, and I hope not. And maybe, maybe the other answer is, well, well, maybe we never really addressed it. We never passed any laws to address environmental issues. But we know that's wrong. I mean, we have you know, thousands of courses and environmental laws throughout the United States and throughout the world. Uh, there are textbooks, there are casebooks, there are law after law after law, there are administrative agencies. Uh, it's endless. We have law professors writing and, and pontificating and, and, and putting all kinds of literature out there as to how to fix things. I mean, even this talk that I'm giving right now, this is not even, it's not just a book that just was just published like a month ago. Uh, it's also going to be a law review article in the uh, George Washington 
a journal of energy and environmental law. Uh, so it, it all, and I'm just one of the hundreds of professors that are you know, solving the problems of the world uh, by uh, coming up with great ideas with more laws and, and what have you. Uh, but none of it's working. I mean, that's my bottom line. That's the paradox. None of it seems to work. Uh, we're failing. And, and the failing is not just, well, bummer, because we're going to have a bad world out there. No, no, bummer. We're going to lose our species uh, if we don't do something about it. I mean, this is serious business. And uh, so what, what drove me to actually try to think through this is, well, why? <laughs> why have our laws, all these laws that we have, why are they not working? Why are they not doing the job? Why are they not fixing this problem? We've known about it in some way since... 1960s, and here we are, you know, multiple years later, and it's it's worse than it ever was before. It's not for lack of trying. Uh, we have great minds in the academic world, great minds in Congress, great minds in state legislatures trying to address these problems. Nothing seems to work, and I'm I'm looking at Glasgow, as I'm sure all of you are as well too. I'm not sensing a great breakthrough there either, which is going to solve our problems. Uh, and, and that was preceded by uh, the, the conferences in Rio and in Coyota and in Paris. And that, you know, that certainly brought the issue to our attention, but didn't solve the problem. So my argument uh, or my, uh, my conclusion, my recommendation was that the, maybe the problem is that this is not a, an unsolvable problem. This is not for lack of trying. It's because we have been using, uh, for lack of a better word, um, an algorithm, uh, a set of instructions that uh, we, we consistently rely on when we turn to legal solutions. And we've been relying on an algorithm that may be wrong, may be built on a poor foundation. And perhaps what we need to do is uh, change the algorithm. Uh, perhaps what we need to do is alter the assumptions we have had when we built the algorithm that essentially was uh, the basis for all these environmental laws or many of the environmental laws that are now in place. So then the question is, well, what is this algorithm? What is it exactly? that we have relied on with all these thousands of laws that have uh, basically become the basis of environmental law. So I decided to try to come up with some themes uh, that uh, are representative of how uh, we have come up with false premises about how we should fix this problem involving our environment. Here they are. Here's the, here's, the, here's the algorithm, and here's, uh, here's some of the issues that I think are problems with the algorithm. And then at the end of this discussion, I will offer a, an alternative algorithm that may have a better chance of success. So here's, here's my conclusions about the algorithm we've been using. Number one, it is an algorithm that has been based on the concept of separation. Separation seems to be uh, the lodestone for how we perceive uh, existence. And uh, by separation, I mean the following. We have presumed that the components of nature, all the components of nature, everything that makes up uh, the, the elements of nature are in fact separated uh, and they are, they, are, uh, they are not working together in any way. They're basically separate. And uh, what they are tending to do, if we, if we leave them alone, is to achieve some kind of a natural baseline, some kind of state of stationarity where we, we have um, equilibrium across the board. Uh, and uh, and these, these separated components uh, inherently want to achieve the state of equilibrium. Uh, and that is what uh, happens when you have all these separate components of, of nature, all seeking the natural uh, baseline. And so that's one form of separation. Another form of separation is the way humans perceive nature. 
uh, we traditionally have perceived nature as being separate from us. We are not connected to nature. We are apart from nature. We're, we're outside of nature. In fact, in many ways, we have presumed we are superior to nature. We can think through how to improve nature because we are superior beings and have the, uh, the, uh, the homo sapien exceptionalism that allows us to basically use our brain power to be able to improve upon nature. Uh, but that's because we're separate from it. We actually look at it. And that has been a historic theme in terms of how humans have taken a look at, uh, at nature. Not only are we separate from nature as humans, we're also separate from humans. Uh, we don't work together as humans. We are very separate individual entities uh, that are only interested in our own well-being. We are not uh, collaborative uh, individuals. We are separate individuals is, is another presumption that we've had. And not only are we separate as human beings, we are separate from our laws as well. <clears throat> our laws are outside of us. Uh, in fact, our laws are, uh, are to be given to uh, authorities and agencies. And in a top-down system, uh, the laws basically tell us what to do. Or actually, they tell us what not to do. Uh, it seems to be the way the laws work. Uh, and, and that's a form of separation as well, too, which is I am simply uh, doing what the law tells me to do because the, the law and the legal decision makers know better than I, and uh, they tell me what I should do because I am separate from the laws. So that's, that's one reality, I think, that we have been using uh, for the last uh, 60 plus years of environmental decision making, which is an algorithm based on separation. And number two, number one is separation. Number two is what we seem to have done also is we seem to have uh, decided that it's probably a good idea to continue to rely on neoclassical uh, economics, uh, traditional neoclassical uh, economics. And neoclassical economics, which has been taught in colleges and universities for you know, a century, <coughs> essentially presumes that human beings are driven by their selfish desire to maximize their own utility, period. That's what drives us as human beings under neoclassical economics is our desire to be selfish, welfare maximizing, utility maximizing, optimizing individuals, not collective group think individuals, but individually, I want to benefit myself. I don't care about the earth around me. I don't care about the rest of the people around me. I care about uh, benefiting myself only. And uh, let's use that reality of, of human beings to build laws, all right? If, if it turns out that's, what, that's who human beings are, let's make sure our laws reflect the fact that people are gonna act that way. And if people are gonna act that way, then we can operate accordingly. We can pass laws that disincentivize uh, individuals from uh, acting uh, selfishly. We can punish them uh, if they act in a selfish way or something like that. So we've relied on this assumption about uh, social utility and, and, and optimization uh, reality uh, and the desire to <clears throat> internalize the costs uh, that are being imposed on others. And, and that will allow the social benefit for all and uh, you know, remove negative externalities and all that. And that has been the basis for our laws. And, and that's the second presumption. That's the second part of the algorithm, which is who we are. Uh, we, you know, we are what the, uh, the neoclassical economics uh, uh, professors tell us uh, we have been, uh, which is this selfish group of individuals who don't really care about the rest of humanity. The third part of the algorithm at least according to my theory, uh, is that uh, we have had a particular assumption about science. Uh, and the science that we have presumed is the, the science that works 
and the proper role of science is what I call utilitarian science, which is essentially science that really does only one thing. It basically tells us what we are observing. It tells us, uh, to use a compact phrase, it tells us what is out there. It tells us what is happening in the environment, what is happening in terms of what we are doing to the environment, you know, cause and effect. Humans are doing X, the environment responds by Y. And when we know that, then we can come up with laws that mitigate uh, or, or prevent what we are doing to harm uh, the environment. And that's the only role of science is to try to basically figure out what is, uh, not uh, anything beyond that. And science traditionally has not played much of a role in policy making. Uh, policy making has been a separate issue. Uh, we leave that to uh, legislators, politicians, policy makers. Uh, science shouldn't play a role in terms of what we should do. That is a separate matter for exceptional humans. Uh, we don't rely on science uh, for that. So there you have it. That's the algorithm uh, that I think has been <clears throat> in place uh, driving our environmental laws, separation, neoclassical economics, and utilitarian science. So now the question is, <clears throat> is there a better algorithm out there? Are there other assumptions that may be more correct may be more uh, realistic in terms of how things work and how things uh, do work that maybe would pr produce better, better results. And my argument uh, is the following. Uh, well, yes, there is. Uh, let's start with the first idea, which is separation. Um, separation is really not the way we should describe uh, the reality of humans and nature and humans and nature. Uh, and in fact, uh, the way I think we are pretty much con uh, conceding uh, is reality now is that there is no such thing as nature operating in, in separate compartments to achieve some kind of natural baseline and equilibrium. Nature does not work that way. Uh, nature is not seeking stationarity. Uh, nature is not you know, by itself uh, working separately uh, to magically arrive at this baseline. Uh, the way it works is that nature is something called a complex adaptive system. And as a complex adaptive system, nature is always interacting with nature. Uh, the components of nature all work together. Uh, and they are not only working together, they are not working in, in a unified fashion. They are constantly changing and adapting to change circumstances. And it is that fact of constant change that you know, characterizes how nature operates. Uh, it is not something that is stationarity at all or stationary. It is a very complex system that is changing. Uh, and, is, and, and that is what causes the health of the system. The actual change and the changes that take place uh, as a response to stimulus uh, is what causes a system to become stronger. Uh, baselines, natural baselines, make us weaker. Uh, and nature, I think, in some ways understands that. I mean, this is not me thinking. This is what a biologist basically assume. So we don't have separation. We have a complex adaptive system where nature and ecosystems work uh, together, essentially. And, uh, and of course, the second reality, which is, should be no surprise to anybody, is that humans are not separate from nature. Humans are part of nature. We are all integrated into nature. We are nature and nature uh, is us. And in fact, uh, policymakers and academics have come up with a term to describe this connection. And it's called a social uh, ecological system, an SES. A social ecological system is a system that basically has nature and humans work together as one entity. It's not separate between nature and humans, the environment and humans, which is what we traditionally assume to be the situation. No, we're all, we're all connected and we, and we connect constantly with our environment. 
environmental law is human law in some ways uh, as well. So let's get rid of separation and add uh, interconnection. Uh, add um, the term that uh, some folks use and I embrace is entanglement. Uh, entanglement is a better description of humans, how humans relate to humans, and how humans relate to nature, and how nature relates uh, to nature. It's entanglement seems to be a better uh, seems to be a better description. Uh, and in fact, if you extend that to humans and law, uh, I think we we are beginning to realize that this top down notion of um, legal decision making may not be the most effective way uh, to proceed. Uh, perhaps it's a better way uh, to include uh, the individual decision-making and choice-making uh, within uh, a legal system. Uh, allow humans more discretion in terms of how they are making decisions as opposed to having it be some flat rule that is brought down upon us by some uh, decision maker. So instead of having separation, let's have those that are being regulated, those that are the, the source of the problem, which are humans, be part of the solution, to use a cliche, uh, and have the humans be more active in terms of being a participant in some legal issue. So let's get rid of separation and, and add instead entanglement or interconnection. Number two, uh, this whole idea of neoclassical uh, economics uh, intuitively makes sense, but as I think most of us are aware of right now, there has been uh, a lot more research uh, among uh, psychologists and uh, economists who have come to the realization that those assumptions by neoclassical economists are not necessarily uh, correct that in fact, human beings are not always social optimizers, uh, individual utility maximizers and all that. And in fact, there's this brand new school uh, that has emerged. This actually is not so new now, uh, but it's called behavioral economics. Uh, this is the Daniel Kahanan uh, idea uh, that's been embraced by many other decision makers and scientists, which essentially debunk many of the assumptions that neoclassical economic professors have had, where we are not necessarily selfish, you know, utility maximizers. In fact, we do collaborate. In fact, we do act altruistically. In fact, we do as humans have this, um, this notion of green behavior sometimes where we want to actually uh, do good by, by nature, even though we can't necessarily see our direct benefit as a result, because we want nature to be uh, free of some of the, uh, the ills that humans have uh, bestowed upon it. Uh, and this behavior has been observed, it's real, and it is counter to what the neoclassical economists assume uh, the way human beings operate. We do operate sometimes uh, collectively, and we do operate in a way where we uh, are, are, are seeking the, the best for not just me, but for others as well. And, and if that's the case, maybe the laws should tap into that, should tap into this, this behavior, which is again, counterintuitive. We're not just selfish welfare maximizers. We also care about each other. Uh, and we are not uh, just going through life solo. Uh, we are going through life with, with, with the world of, of people around us as well. And then finally, the final change we might be able to make is, well, why don't we change our idea about science? Maybe science should be more than just telling us about what is. Maybe we should expand the role of science to be more what should be. Instead of having that be a human policy-driven decision, maybe turn to science and ask science, well, what should be? And not ask humans to decide that, but ask science uh, to decide that. And in my uh, you know, book and articles, I basically call that explanatory science, not utilitarian science, but explanatory science. And if we do turn to science to, to try to decide what should be, 
not just what is, which is what we traditionally do with science, but decide what should be, then what do, how do we find that? How do we find out what that is? Well, one of the things that science can tell us is the following. And I think science has told us this as well too. And that is that there is a principle out there that I call, and I'm not the only one who calls it, this is not my term. It's called the principle of universality, which essentially says there are some laws out there that are universal that are basically so universal that they apply everywhere. They apply in the subatomic arena and they apply in the, you know, when you're dealing with galaxies. Uh, these laws are so universal that they apply not just anywhere, these laws apply anytime, anytime. Uh, they apply a thousand years ago, they are going to apply a thousand years in the future. They apply anytime and anywhere. And, and they are, but, but to, to, to meet the standard of being a universal law, they have to be laws that are predictable and that are laws that we can observe and laws that exist in any frame. Uh, again, from the subatomic to the uh, uh, galactic, uh, they apply every, and they certainly apply on planet Earth, and they certainly apply to our environment as well. Uh, and that, and that's what science is telling us: is there are laws out there that are universal laws, and those laws we can call, uh, or I call, uh, the laws of nature, the laws of nature. So the question would then be, well, that sounds great in the abstract. But what the hell are these laws? I mean, are there laws out there that essentially are universal laws uh, that apply uh, everywhere? And if so, what are those? What are those laws? Um, and 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 then and I believe there are such laws, and I believe they are uh, countable. They're not an infinite number of such laws. And and I further think that if there are laws of nature that we can uh, identify and, and, and take a look at, then perhaps what we have been missing in our environmental laws over the last 60 years is that our environmental laws have not been consistent with the universal laws of nature. Because our laws of the environment that we teach in environmental law are in fact uh, laws involving nature. And the argument that I make, and again, it's all, that's all it is, is an argument. The, the, law, the argument that I make is that should not our laws about nature reflect the laws of nature, right? Should not our laws about nature, which is all our, our environmental laws, should not they also reflect the laws of nature? Uh, there you have it, Tracy. There's the, there's the bottom line. You can leave now. You can all leave now. <laughs> You've got my theme right there, okay? Should not the laws uh, about nature, our environmental laws, reflect the laws of nature? And the, my argument, of course, is yes, they should. They should reflect the laws of nature. So now, the question is, well, what are these laws of nature? And uh, my, and again, this is, this is way outside contracts and torts and property law. Uh, my understanding uh, is the following. There are, in fact, three laws of nature that uh, meet the test of the principle of universality, which, a lot, which means they have to apply uh, everywhere. And if so, what are those what are those three laws? And here they are. Law number one, law of nature number one. And again, environmental laws should conform to these laws. Law of nature number one is connection. Connection. Not separation, connection. Uh, the, the, the default principle and assumption has got to be that things are basically connected interconnected, entangled. They are not separated, they are entangled. Whether we're talking about humans and humans, humans and nature, nature and nature, components of nature, it's all interconnected. 
And so when we look at nature, uh, things are not separate. They are all interconnected. A galaxy A in the universe is somehow connected also to galaxy, uh, galaxy B. And when you go to the subatomic uh, world uh, and the world of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, we can see connections uh, as well in that world, surprisingly. And we certainly can see connections in the environment. And, uh, and that's almost intuitive at this point. Everything we do to the environment, no matter how innocuous, is connected to everything else. And there will be an effect. There will be an effect. Uh, when I breathe carbon dioxide out, uh, it doesn't just disappear uh, into the universe. It actually goes into our atmosphere and becomes part of the carbon dioxide that is now, uh, you know, inexorably, you know, gradually increasing uh, on this planet. It's all connected. Everything we do is connected to everything else. So that's principle number one is connection. Principle number two is called, um, uh, it's, it's really called the, um, uh, the principle of parsimony or the principle of economy, or uh, sometimes if you wanna be really fancy, uh, it's called Occam's razor, which essentially means that um, when you're trying to, to understand a complex system uh, or even a complex problem, usually the simplest solution and the simplest uh, way of, of looking at something is the correct way. Uh, it's not as complex as you think. And in fact, there's even a theory called chaos theory, which basically presumes that even in chaos, uh, you can find some simple rules that are driving the chaotic stream of events that seem to be completely random. Uh, there are in fact certain you know, regularities that take place within and predictive uh, regularities that, that occur within chaos. So the second simple, the second principle uh, and the second law of nature would be simplicity, not complexity, but simplicity. A less is more. <clears throat> the more simple a system is, the, the more likely it is to be successful. So we have, we have connection and we have simplicity. And then the final, the final law of nature, which is to me the most interesting of, of one of all, and one that I certainly don't consider myself expert in, but it seems to be implanted in everybody who looks into this topic, the third and final law of nature is symmetry. Uh, symmetry governs virtually everything <clears throat> that describes nature. Uh, and there's all kinds of different ways of looking at symmetry, but symmetry uh, is in fact a recurring reality when it comes to how we look at uh, and nature. Uh, and symmetry is a way, furthermore, for us to predict how things are going to be. <clears throat> there is some argument that Einstein <clears throat> was able to predict uh, the general theory of relativity by using uh, the principles of symmetry to basically figure out how you know it would work uh, when he was putting together his his uh, two important uh, principles. So symmetry would be uh, another example of uh, a universal law that you find uh, everywhere. And let me just give you two quick examples about symmetry, which I like. Because uh, it, it makes sense, and I can even understand it. Uh, example number one of symmetry is the following, and that is: <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why a honeybee always, always, wherever the honeybee is, always uh, makes a honeycomb using the same shape, always? And what is that shape? It's a hexagon, a symmetrical. <clears throat> hexagon. Now, why does a honeybee, without being taught by, by the queen bee to, to do so, always uses a hexagon, uh, which is a, a symmetrical six-sided object? And the answer, as it turns out, which has now been mathematically proved, is that that hexagon, as opposed to a circle or a triangle or a square or a rectangle, the hexagon is the one shape which allows the honeybee to produce the maximum amount of honey or hold the maximum amount of honey 
with the least amount of wax. Just imagine that. And how did you can figure that out? Or at least by evolutionary reality, it's, they figured it out. Uh, and, and, and it's symmetry, essentially. Symmetry, it's symmetry rules. The same is true with a snowflake, a six-sided snowflake. The same is true if you take a look at the, uh, the symmetry inside of a sunflower. Uh, I didn't understand this until recently, but if you look at a sunflower, the way the sunflower unfolds uh, is uh, by using a series of Fibonacci numbers uh, around the spirals of the, uh, of the sunflower. Uh, and, and why does the sunflower use Fibonacci numbers to figure out the placement of seeds around the sunflower in a symmetrical fashion? And the answer is that is the most efficient way to have the most seeds in a spiral uh, situation. Uh, in a spiral shape, is using Fibonacci numbers. Uh, and, and the sunflower knows how to do it, at least over, over you know, millions of years, evolutionary changes ensured that those sunflowers that use Fibonacci numbers were the ones who were going to survive. And then you go to the other side of, the, of, of size and, and go to the galaxies, uh, we now begin to think that uh, our, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is perfectly symmetrical. The arms of our galaxy, the two arms of our galaxy, mirror each other, mirror symmetry. Uh, and they do it not by chance, but because symmetry rules everything. So anyway, there you have it. There are the three natural, the laws of nature, which is connection, symmetry, and simplicity. Now, Let's conclude. Uh, if that's true, if that's true, then, then what should our laws look like? What should our environmental laws look like? If we want to have that, you know, reflect the laws, the three laws of nature. All right, well, number one, they, they, they need to connect. The laws need to connect us. They need to connect us to the issue we're trying to address. They need to connect humans to humans and humans to nature and humans to the law itself. Uh, and the other thing the laws need to do is they need to be symmetrical, and the laws would also need to be simple. So by the way, are our environmental laws simple right now? The answer is no. Oh, no. We have the most complex set of environmental laws that I think a human being could ever imagine. I mean, you take a look at environmental law uh, case books, textbooks, horn books, what have you. There, there are thousands of pages <coughs> long. <clears throat> too very difficult to, to figure out. We don't have a simple system of environmental laws in this country or other countries uh, as well. So we should simplify things. So how do you do that? How do you simplify and connect and, and, and employ symmetry? Well, my argument uh, in, in, in my book and in my, my articles is the following. Let's come up with and adopt uh, a reciprocal, Right duty dichotomy, right duty dichotomy, very much <clears throat> like a, a John Locke, uh, Immanuel Kant uh, system, where we basically uh, use right and duty uh, as uh, what our laws are going to be. We're going to keep it simple. We're going we're to bestow a right and we're going to impose a duty. That's it. Create a right and, and uh, impose a duty, and nothing more than that. We're not going to have 20,000 pages of administrative regulations. It's going to be a right duty dichotomy. Uh, uh, a duty is the symmetrical corollary of a right. So we meet the test of uh, symmetry. So it's simple, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's symmetrical. And, uh, and if we have a right and a duty, then uh, who does it meet this, the test of connection? Well, it depends on what the, what the right and the duty is. And what my proposed right would be is let's do the following. Let's give a right uh, to not humans. We, we do have a right uh, now in many states where you have a right to a clean environment. And, but it's always given to humans. <clears throat> humans have a right to a clean environment. Uh, why not, instead of giving the right to a clean environment to humans, why not give it to the SES? Why not give it to the humans, nature, uh, social, ecological system? So that system has a right. And the right would be 
the right of basically sustainability. Uh, we, we would the right would be to create to ensure that the system allows uh, the uh, SES to continue. Essentially, it's a right of sustainability to the SES, and it's not just humans. It's the ecological side it has a right to exist as well too. So we are giving a right to humans and the and nature combined as an SES. And either one can raise the right uh, to the, 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 the sustainability and the continuation of an SES on this planet. Because if we don't have an SES, we don't have humans. And we will definitely have a different system than we've ever had before uh, on this planet without, or at least without humans, we're not gonna have a human-based system anymore. So we wanna keep humans around selfishly. So let's have an SES right. So that the right would be to a continuation of conditions that allow us to have, I think the term would be a safe space for the continuation of the SES or a safe space for humanity. And then the duty, the duty would be a duty imposed not on nature because nature doesn't give a damn what duties we impose on it, but the duty is imposed on humans and the duty imposed on humans is to ensure that you take actions to continue the SES, you know, our social ecological system here. A duty continue the, uh, the SES. And that is only imposed on the, uh, the, the human component of the SES because you can't impose a duty on nature. And that's it. You know, that, that is, it, it, impose a, create a right, impose a duty. And when you do those two simple, symmetrical, uh, and they're connected, because they're connected to, we're connecting nature uh, and humans, and we're connecting them directly to the law itself, then maybe we have not just a different algorithm, maybe we have a different result altogether. And I think my time is up. Am I correct, Ray? I think I am. <laughs> I think you have timed it just about perfectly. We have about five to six minutes left for right. the session. And first of all, thank you for a fascinating and very stimulating discussion. Uh, it's uh, very, not the, the usual sort of legalistic talk that we have. No, no, it is not. <laughs> no, it is not. Uh, so with that, uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Let me go ahead and see if I can kick things off by asking perhaps a, 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 a more practical question, which is, I think what you'll find is that a lot of folks will find this idea intriguing, but translating it into something that actually governs day-to-day -day activity is hard to visualize. So can you give us an example beyond an investment of a right and a corresponding obligation? What would, for example, a climate law look like if it was going to be, or you know, assuming a climate law is appropriate, maybe you just need to have something even more simple and more broad reaching. But if there was a climate law, how would it reflect the three principles that you're talking about? I mean, do we go from the thousand page Waxman Markey bill down to a one page statement of principles of investing rights in the, in the climate system? Well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, the, the laws themselves are not, don't, don't exist because the, there's only two laws in, in my system. The law of, of, we are given rights to the SES and the and then we also are imposing a duty. Those are the only laws out there. We're not going to create uh, some kind of a climate change system. <clears throat> we are going to drive climate change from the bottom up. Essentially, we are going to have either humans or nature raising the rights of nature to ensure that uh, that which is causing climate change is abated in some fashion. And so we are actually empowering the SES to uh, whatever it takes uh, to uh, reduce those activities that are producing the damage to the climate. So there is not a, a creation of a law. The law is already in place. It's a very simple law. It's a right duty law. And we don't have an overlay of some great administrative scheme uh, unless as a result of, of requiring uh, those activities that are producing uh, the uh, the harm to the or, or producing the changes to the climate 
if they need some guidance by way of some administrative guidance to get the job done, maybe we can create that. But what's driving the change is the SES under my system is saying, uh, I have a right to sustainability. You are denying me that right. You now must change. And it's just, a, it's an enforceable right that is now being imposed. Now, you probably are not going to rely on courts to do that. You probably need some administrative apparatus uh, to pull it off. But I, I am not assuming we need to have a complex, big statutory, you know, multi-page system uh, to pull that off, because that just produces more complexity, which, which stops everything. Uh, thank you. And, and this may be a, a <coughs> correlated question to the same spirit, and, uh, and hopefully I'm not going to terribly mangle uh, our questioner's name, but Sanju Dinapanre has asked whether or not this might be a concept that is uh, perhaps suited for changes to national constitutional rights and sort of putting it in sort of an aspirational larger system as a ground right principle that would drive laws. And it's sort of some, it sounds like a similar spirit you're talking about, but it also sounds like constitutions are just a legal version of the same sort of principles that maybe don't capture what you're getting at. Well, that's, that's a very good point, which is uh, what's going to be the source of the right and the duty. Uh, and I think if you wanted to be serious about it, it would actually be not by way of a statute or by way of some judge-driven common law creation. It would be part of a constitution, essentially. Uh, it would be, it, we, we could amend our constitution to have, uh, have uh, something like that be embedded uh, within it. I mean, of course, that's, that's pie in the sky stuff that would not occur unless we were really in a bad way in terms of our environment here. But I think ultimately that's right. Uh, if we are serious about uh, our survivability and our existence, it would probably re require us to basically uh, change our constitutions. And the United States Constitution has the ability to be amended to, in fact, reflect exactly what I am proposing right now. And I did not make that argument in my uh, book or article, but boy, that sounds like a great idea. Thank you. And it, it sounds like they may have some interesting parallels as well in international law development and customer international law. Yeah. Again, it's sort of a how to translate as opposed to the root principles you're getting at. Yeah, uh, international law, I completely agree. That's, that's the best way to accomplish this, not just American law. Correct. Uh, all right. I think we have time for one more question. And Alban, you'd actually asked the first question in the chat. I was wondering if you'd like to, to ask your question, and then we can go ahead and wrap up. Oh, go ahead and wrap up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, and that's probably makes sense because it is now 9.58. So with our final 90 seconds, do you, any final thoughts you'd like to offer, Jim, before we conclude? No, I, I appreciate your willingness to listen to me and hear me out. Uh, and I enjoy uh, passing my thoughts on to you. And uh, uh, the, the book is published by Edward Elgar. And it's, it is called Rethinking Environmental Law. Uh, so I think it's been out for one month uh, right now. Uh, this article by George Washington uh, will be published, I believe, at the end of this month or the beginning of, of December. And it's pretty much the same, uh, the same ideas. And, uh, and I, like so many others, we're just trying to see if there's, is there another way that may be more successful than the uh, ways we have been trying, which don't seem to be working for some reason. Well, and I'll, I'll gently remind everybody on the call that the flyer announcing Jan's talk has a link to his book, so you can order your own copy. Uh, <laughs> So uh, with that, thanks again to everybody for joining our talk this month. Uh, we, uh, Bob, I'll, I'll pass the baton to you to remind everyone about next month's talk. But I just want to say personally, as always, it's a great pleasure to talk with John. I hope we get a chance, Jan, to talk again at, if you're going to avail for the Rocky Mountain Merrill Law Foundation meeting next summer. I may. And, I may very well be doing that, yes. In person, an actual physical meeting, which is a that strange That would be talk. nice. That would be very nice. And everyone else, thank you very much for joining us on our call today. And Alban, the, the baton's yours to wrap things up. Yes. Uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Lisa Sachs from Columbia University on the role of, uh, of uh, international investment law for natural resources and climate. And it will be on, uh, it will be in, uh, it, um, it will be on November uh, 22nd. All right, then Bye. thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next month. Take care.